Hard to say the ah uh, sounds. So I called her Yugi. Isn't that Yugi? Is that funny? Is that funny, Mom? Is that funny? I was too lazy to say the ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Little turkey. <laughs> he has a good do, huh? Ah. Did you post it yesterday? The picture? <laughs> he told you to post it. He was <laughs> Oh, it's time for church. Let there be worship. Let there be worship. Here, look straight. Here, look at my offering in time. Your hair is up. I can see you right through the street. You look great. Oh, well, I'm getting a look. It pops out. Praise God today. Amen. It's good Amen. to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to gather Amen. together in here. We welcome all those who are joining us on the internet. And invite you to worship the Lord with us today. I yes. encourage you, don't get involved in something else. There's plenty of, there will be plenty of distractions. Yes. If you're not careful, the distractions will take away your ability to hear from the Lord. Amen. We want to hear from God today. Amen. So let us worship him with our hearts. As we open our heart to him in worship, we will be receptive to what he has to say to us yes. in the spirit. Praise God. Lift your voice with me today as we pray. Lord, we glorify you in this place today. We thank you for providing us a place to gather. We ask, Lord, that you will bless uh, this service today and let your name be lifted up by all that we say and do. For all those who are with us over the airwaves and those are, who are here with us in the building, we ask your anointing upon us all today in yes, Jesus' Lord. name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. We're going to start off with a nice, uh, upbeat song. It's a promise. I'll... Fly away.
Oh, 
you're watching online, if you wish to participate, if you'll let us know. Uh, okay, we'll come by and pick it up, or if you want to mail it to us, to 115 West Chestnut Avenue in Las Cruces, New Mexico, 88005. It'll be a blessing, and we'll be thankful for all the help that anyone can get. Praise the Lord. We want to remind everyone that we are grateful for the help and the assistance that each one gets. And as you feel led to participate in the support of this fellowship, may God bless you and return to you. And we thank God because he is our source. Yes, amen. The people who listen to him are the channels that he uses. But he is our source and we trust him for every need to be met. And we're thanking him for it today. Praise God. Lord, for this offering we're about to receive, we give you thanks. We praise you for the fact that you are our provider and you take care of us even in times of difficulty. We ask you to bless this offering and multiply it to meet the need. Bless each one who gives and Bless them for their faithfulness. And Lord, according to the promise of your word, return it to them many fold in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to sing a well known uh, old faithful called Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Praise the Lord. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice 
and be glad in it. You know, sometimes when we look in the natural around and we say, oh my goodness, things are a mess. But when we stop and think about what the Lord has done, yes. what the Lord is doing, and what the Lord has promised to do, Amen. it is just yes. astonishing. Amen. And I am delighted today for us to be able to pray for the River of Living Water Parish. It is a church that's theme for the month of April is, what do you think it would be? All the stuff that's been going on with all the way that all the things that the news has had to say. What do you think their theme of the month is? Oh, I like this church. April, our month to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You understand that scripture tells us that God inhabits the praise of his people. It doesn't say that he inhabits the big cathedrals or the fabulous buildings or the large congregations that come together. It says he inhabits the praise of his people. And it says, where two or more are gathered together in his name, he's going to be there. The secret is being gathered together in his name. And it sounds to me like this little congregation over on Divot Avenue understands how to get the Lord to participate in their services. So today I'd like for you to join me in prayer. For our CCG, River of Living Water Parish, for their congregation, that their, the joy of the Lord that they have will be spread. That when, pe when they go into the grocery store, people will look on their face and they'll say, why are they so happy? And they'll take the time to stop and ask. Because you know what? There are a lot of people right now who aren't very happy. I spent the last three days making phone calls throughout New Mexico. We made thousands of phone calls, thousands of phone calls, actually over 100,000 phone calls made in New Mexico this last weekend, doing predominantly wellness checks on people in New Mexico. Um, and it was wonderful because I talked to folks who said, oh, honey, we're doing fine. We're doing, we've lived through worse. It's really all right. Um, but several occasions, I had the opportunity to pray with people who were struggling. Not necessarily struggling over the circumstances of the limitations that we've got put on us right now, but struggling over life. And it was so very special to be able to say, well, I can't help you. I, there's nothing I can do to make that better. But I know someone who can. Yes, can we pray yes. with you? Do you know not one person said, no, thank you. I would prefer that you don't. As a matter of fact, when I offered to pray with people, they crumbled. They said, please, would you pray with me? And it was such an exciting and, and wonderful experience. I can't even begin to tell you. But it is that amazing joy of the Lord. It's the rejoicing in the Spirit of God that can bring us peace and can bring us comfort. And let's just pray for River of Living Water Parish that they will be able to share their peace and their joy with the hungry and the hurting and the unsaved, the people who don't know the Lord. There are a lot of people who don't know the Lord. There are some people who've rejected him too. But there are a lot of people who don't know it at all. So let's, if you would, those of you who are here, if you'll stand with me and let's bow our heads and pray. Join with me in prayer. Oh, yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every lighthouse that brings your name before this valley. We thank you for every bit of word that goes forth in this valley that lifts up your name, that lifts up your word that teaches who you are. But Lord, today we're focusing on this congregation over on Divot Avenue. You know them better than we do, but I think they know you pretty well because they spend time in rejoicing 
and in prayer and in ministry to the people around them. Lord, I loved reading about them and seeing people commenting and saying, boy, if you have a need, these people don't care what denomination you come from. They minister to your need. and they, they show you love. Lord, I ask you to bless this ministry. Bless it and help it. Share the, the secrets that you've taught them about who you are with the world around them. Lord, inspire the the congregation as they receive your word, inspire the ministry as they give your word. And Lord, I ask that you open doors for each and every one of the congregation in this next week, that they can have an encounter with someone who doesn't know you, and that they can share with that person that they are meeting who you are, that a seed be planted that will result in an eternal destiny. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I like your talk. <laughs> Brother Scott's going to come at this time. Praise God. Amen, amen, amen. It is good to know that our God is a living God. Yes. Praise Good morning. Good morning. Did you know that God likes to confirm his word, whether it is his scripture or things that he's maybe told you? It's actually in the Bible. In Mark 16, Jesus gave the, the disciples the Great Commission. Then after... And then it says this, After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. So God likes to confirm his word. Yeah. Now sometimes we, we think, well, God, did you really say that to me? He's in the confirming business. Yes, he is. Amen. You hear a lot of prophetic yes. words like, is that really true? Just wait. If it's from God, he will confirm it. Yes. This week, or last week, I felt like God had told me something, so I, I shared it up here. And then, you know how the enemy is. Are you really sure that was from God and not from you? Well, there was a, uh, it was a prophetic word. It was from somebody that I trust. So I was like, okay. So I read it. After I started reading it, it was like, God, you really did say that to me because here it is again. <laughs> so God will confirm yes. his word, right. whether it's his scripture or through what he's told you, you either confirm by saying, yes, I really did say that, or just to show you that it was me, let me show you what I can do. Right. And if we look at things that are going around, the weather will confirm what he said. The, uh, just the events, just everything around us will confirm what God is saying. Whether if he's a direct word to you or you felt like, well, God said that, just, if you're not sure, ask him, God, would you confirm that? Because yes, your word says you will confirm. But that takes listening and being attuned to what, what he's saying. Because if we let our mind just try and figure it out on our own, eventually we'll be like, oh, that's just a coincidence. You heard that somewhere else. It really wasn't God. And of course, the enemy will, will help that along too. Sometimes it, the enemy doesn't need any help, our mind does it on, our, on its own. But you put the two of them together, they can pretty much convince you that what you, what you read in scripture or what you saw, that wasn't God. It was just a coincidence. But it takes faith and listening 
to God. Faith is like, no matter what my brain or what anybody else says or what the enemy tries to convince me of, I know that I know that, God, that was you, and I'm going to stand on that. And it takes listening to, to hear what he's saying. And if you let him, he will speak to you. And he will say, remember that? That confirmed this. Or this is confirming what I said there. So listen. Have faith and stand on what he says. Okay. Announcements this week? First announcement is going to be hot, so you better have your AC on or working or a lot of fans because there is not a day out of the 90s that I saw in the next 10 days. And I think it goes longer than that. I saw a 15 day forecast, and only the last two days at the very end said 89. But then that's 15 days away. It'll change by then. So make sure you stay cool, stay safe. And other than the, the other announcement is Thursday night via Zoom, we will have setting the atmosphere. Time we get together, catch up, see everybody's faces, and then we pray together. And believe me, it's just like if you were we were all together in one room. God is doing something that just kind of blowing everybody's minds. Like, how can that be? We're not together, but it feels like we're together. It's like the old mindset of if we're not together, we're not together is evaporating. Now, now it's we might not be together, but we're together. So, uh, it's Thursday night. I always look forward to because even if just sitting there is like. Yeah, God, you're good. Somebody may not be praying out loud for everybody here, but everybody's praying. And the presence of God is always there. Yes, amen. So if you're able to, or you know somebody that would like to join, I will be posting a link through text or on Facebook so that anybody that wants to can join. Please pass that link around because it's not an exclusive club. Right. Let people know about it. Say, hey, come join us. Do they need to have ever come to this church? No. Are they a people of God? Or somebody that is interested and is trying to figure out who is this God person? Yes, Perfect place for them to come. So share it, and we'll let's gather together via Zoom, and let's set our atmosphere in our heart, in our home, and in our community. For Operation World today, we are in a little tiny nation between Madagascar and Mozambique called Comoros. Four, actually it's three islands, and it's not a very big population, less than 700,000, so less than what's in El Paso. But as you can tell from those numbers, 90, some numbers, current numbers say 99% Muslim. But the church there is growing faster than the mosques. So that's some good news. They are, um, you arrive to the island, you think, oh, this is a great place. But since they gained, because it's beautiful, it's be weather's nice, it's tropical, but then you get to know the place a little bit, and you realize maybe this isn't the paradise that it looks. Since they've gained independence, they have had many, many multiple military, political coups, and the government is changing hands all the time. They do have a constitution that they've been voted on, but they're still in political upheaval. And people are searching. They're one of those governments that says there is freedom of religion. But if you look at the numbers, that is not the case. 
Because if it was really freedom of religion, would everybody, that many people, really be just Muslim? Because there, if you're Muslim, you've got a name. Yeah. You can get the government help. You can get what you need if you're or whatever. Nobody's going to harass you if you're anything else. Harassment is there, even though the government says, oh, no, that doesn't happen here. So they need, this is a country that is definite need of a revival. The video today will be a gentleman praying for his country. Um, so let's pray along with him as he prays for the island nation of Comoros. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you praying for this country of Comoros. It's a small country of three islands in the Indian Ocean. But Father, we know that your love is with them and you know them. This country has been going through different challenges. The politics have not been stable. Father, the economy is still down and the work of the gospel is still lacking in this nation. But I know that, Father, you love the people of Comoros. You love them, and that's why you sent your son Jesus to die for all of us and die for them as well. Father, in this moment, we pray that you really will stretch your hand upon this nation. Father, I pray that uh, you are going to bring stability in the nation. And Father, give the wisdom to the leaders of the nation to let uh, the freedom of worship so that people can be able to choose their religion. You know that there are many people there who are still dying without hearing the word of the gospel. Father, we need the word to go and touch them. We pray, Father, that you raise your servants to go in the field. As Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. We know that the crops are ripe in Comoros. Many people are waiting to hear the gospel. Father, I pray that you bring situations, you create situations where people will be able to go in and bring the good news that will transform the lives of many and change their destiny. There is also people who are getting served there but they are going through much discouragement, rejection within their families and society. Father, we pray that you raise men and women who are going to be born sons despite the challenges that they are going through. And Father, reach their own people, Father, the gospel, so that many people can be changed and your church can grow stronger in those islands. Oh, Father, we pray that you continue to provide for the people who are willing to go there, provide for the churches that are being planted there, and we pray that the church will be able to go and further sand and shine so that we we'll see many people being served in the islands of the Comoro. Father, thank you for all that you are doing. We pray it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God be merciful, we pray. Hallelujah. Well, I would like to invite you to join me in the Word of God today. Praise the Lord. I want to talk to you about the subject of repentance today. And, uh, bring to our attention the significance 
it's more than just a subject and it is more than just a term. Praise God. Let's go over to the book of James, or excuse me, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, and we're going to go to the second chapter to start this morning. Thank God. Okay, in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, we will begin reading with verses 23. And I want to talk to you about the gift of repentance. So, in verse 23, the apostle advises us, foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Some people just ask questions for the trouble, for the purpose of just stirring things up. He said, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, have to teach patience in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. It says that the Lord will give them repentance. Repentance is a gift from God. As a matter of fact, the scripture tells us that no man cometh to the Father except the Spirit draw him. If you had the awareness and the sense to know that you needed forgiveness, that was a blessing from God for you to understand that. The, to know that you needed to repent is a gift from God. So, the apostle is saying, in meekness, let's see, let's pray and reach out to them to see if God perhaps will give them repentance. Now, we understand that forgiveness comes because of repentance. You know, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. All of mankind, from Adam till the last person on the face of the earth. Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. But not everyone is going to be saved. There will be a difference, and the difference is some will accept his gift of salvation and some will reject it. So to receive his forgiveness, we must Repent. There was a fellow that uh, I worked with for a while, and he was going through some marital difficulties, and uh, he had a bad, uncontrolled temper. You know, somebody said, he got a bad temper. Well, you know the difference between a bad temper and a good temper? A bad temper is an uncontrolled temper. Now, those who knew my dad knew that his hairstyle was uh, very little hair on top. As a matter of fact, before I was born, he was already almost completely bald. And uh, one day, a lady in the church said to him, Brother Wolf, you see my red hair? I've got a temper to match it. He told her, Sister, I don't have red hair. I don't even have much hair at all. But I got a problem with my temper too. The fact is, an uncontrolled temper can be a very detrimental thing in your life. Well, this fellow had a bad, uncontrolled temper. And when he'd get mad, he would say the meanest things to his wife, and then he would leave her. He would just go get in his truck and disappear, sometimes be gone. He just told her, you know, I'm out of here. I'm not dealing with you anymore, and he would leave. Then after a few days, when he calmed down, he would come back and say, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. I'm back. 
and she got sick and tired of him leaving all the time. So she told him one day, you can come back, but if you pull that stunt again, keep on walking, don't come back. So the next time he got upset, I, yelled at him, I can't take this anymore, I'm out of here, I'm leaving, and he took off. Well, after a few days, he decided to come back just like he always had. And when he got back, she changed the locks on the door. <laughs> He's like, hey, what? Uh, come here, come here. I, I, I want to tell you, I'm sorry. She said, well, I'm glad you're sorry, but you're gone. He said, no, 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 no. We're both Christians, and you know the Christians, if somebody repents, you've got to forgive them. So I'm telling you, I'm sorry. You have to forgive me. She said, I forgive you. You stay out there forgiven. But you're not coming back in the house. And he said to me, Pastor, what's wrong with that woman? She's supposed to forgive me. I said, well, you need to understand something. Saying I'm sorry is not an excuse for manipulating somebody. If you're really sorry, you do something about changing and you don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you're not truly sorry you did it. Repentance is not just a little gimmick that we can use to get by with our sin. Repentance is not um, something that we can do to manipulate God. By the way, do you understand that God knows whether you mean it or not when you say, I'm sorry? You know, maybe sometimes your spouse doesn't know for sure, or maybe sometimes your parents don't know for sure if you mean it when you say, I'm sorry. But you can't fool God on that one. He knows for sure whether or not you mean it. And it's it's not a game you can play. There Years ago, uh, when I was in school, there was one of the young people in the church there that got involved with the wrong crowd and started skipping me out of school and uh, got involved doing things that believers shouldn't do. And he, he got himself you know, headed down the wrong road pretty bad. He came to church on Sunday night and he felt really guilty and the preacher preached a sermon on overcoming sin. He realized, oh man, I've done wrong. When the invitation was given, he went up and prayed and said, God, please forgive me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. If you'll, if, if you'll forgive me, I won't do this anymore. I'll make sure I stay in school and I won't get involved with those guys that are leading me the wrong way and, and I won't do that stuff I've been doing. And the presence of the Lord came to him and deliverance from that sin just washed over him. And he said, oh, thank you, Lord. And he went out. Uh, but when he went back to school on Monday, the guys were sitting there and they said, oh, come on, let's go. He said, no, 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 I can't go. I, come on, don't be a sissy. Let's go. And next thing you know, they convinced him. And he spent the week doing stuff other than going to school. He came to church the next Sunday night and he, he prayed and said, Lord, I, I did fail again. Please forgive me. I should have done that. I'm really sorry. And he really, really repented and, and he felt the wonderful release as the Spirit of God washed over him. And he came up with a pretty good idea. As long as I go to church on Sunday and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I can live like I want to Monday through Saturday. He had found the answer. You didn't. Let me tell you a little something. Even if you think that that's true, nobody guarantees you're going to make it to church Sunday. What happens if you check out on Saturday and you have to say, Lord, uh, uh, well, uh, I was going to repent, Lord. You should be at your home. <laughs> but one Sunday night, the preacher preached against sin. He came to the altar and said, Lord, it's me again. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've really been doing the wrong thing this week, but I may you forgive me. And there was no visitation in the presence of God. He said, Come on, Lord, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm saying I'm sorry. You got to forgive me, Lord. I, I'm repenting. So nothing happened. And he began to get serious. He told me about it later. He said, 
Morris, I couldn't touch heaven no matter what I did. And I understand, I began to understand, I have played a game with God. Folks, we need to understand something. The love of God is precious and the blood of God is sure. But when I ask him to forgive me, but I don't mean it, I can make my, I can cause my heart to become hardened and beyond the reach of the power of God. Somebody said, oh, no, 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 don't say that, preacher. God can do anything. Well, actually, it does tell us over in Hebrews that you can go to a point where you get beyond repentance. Repentance is a gift from God. Don't treat it with contempt or arrogance. I was listening to the radio one day, and uh, there was a lady on there talking, and she made the statement, you better believe I believe in hell. You better know I believe in hell. As a matter of fact, when we get to the other side, if there's no hell, I'm going to be really one irritated person because I know some people that need to go. Well, now, that's not really the reason to believe in hell. The Bible does teach us that there is a place known as hell. And for whatever it's worth, Jesus believed in hell. Uh, you know, there's some people try to tell us, well, hell's not really, really a place of judgment. According to Jesus, it is. And others say, well, no, if, you, if you've been really bad, you'll have to go to hell for a while. You know, you'll have to serve time. You know, it's, it's a weird thing. In our criminal justice system, you can get a life sentence. And then after you've spent a few years in jail, then you get out on probation. You know, some people, they were so bad, they gave them four life sentences. Well, how can you have four life sentences? Life was supposed to mean you're in jail for the rest of your life. But it doesn't quite mean that. So we get the idea that we can apply that principle to God. And when God says, if you go to hell, you're going to be separated from him forever. But, well, maybe not completely forever. Maybe just, you know, God, the merciful God, eventually he's going to say, okay, well, you served enough time in hell. Come on, you can go to heaven. I like the way the great revivalist Charles Finney said it. He said, you don't get saved by hell. You get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, you know, the Bible depicts that scene in, in the holy city where the people are gathering around the throne of the Lord and they're singing, worthy is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And they're glorifying the Lord and laying their crowns at his feet and thanking him for dying and giving them salvation. And can you just imagine while the the redeemed are standing around the throne of God and praising him and thanking for the great price that Jesus paid. And you all of a sudden you hear somebody saying, thank God for hell. Yep, I sinned and I went to hell, but I did my time and now I've been saved by hell. Be assured of this, nobody's going to be thanking God for hell in heaven. The answer is for us to get right with God while we're here. The scripture declares over in the book of Ecclesiastes that as the tree falleth, so shall it lie. And that's a uh, reference to the fact the condition you are in when you die is the condition in which you will meet God. Don't take your sins into eternity because in eternity there is no forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin is in this box called time that God has put us in. And if we will repent of our sins while we're here, we can be delivered from the curse of those sins and forever be um, redeemed from that curse to be in the presence of God forever. I'm thinking of the story of a guy in the Old Testament. His name is Ahab. Ahab was a spoiled brat. He was a spoiled brat. <laughs> as a little kid and yet never outgrew it. Early in our marriage, Pam made a pact with me. She said, I love to spoil you. Well, I have to tell you, I kind of like what she does. <laughs> but she said, you need to understand something about when I spoil you. 
I'll spoil you as long as you appreciate it. If you start taking it for granted, buddy, you will derail the goody train. <laughs> she meant it too. I'm still trying to be very grateful. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, you know, we used to tell our granddaughter, we love to spoil you, but we don't want you to be a spoiled brat. So you have to appreciate it when we spoil you. You know, it was such that when people would tell her she was spoiled, she'd say, yes, I know I am. They just love me so much. <laughs> it's okay to be spoiled as long as you aren't a spoiled brat. But Ahab was a spoiled brat as a kid. And if he didn't get his way, he would just throw a fit, you know. He would kick the tree and go sulk for a while. You know, if you don't get your way and you want to come sulking around me, I'm going to just ignore you. I'm not going to be manipulated by someone else's soul. A friend of mine who's a pastor back east told the story of one day a lady in that church began to uh, be very cool and distant toward his wife. And uh, so his wife said, you know, I think, I think she's offended about something, but I don't know what I did. He said, well, just leave it alone. Leave it alone. But his wife couldn't leave it alone. She finally went to her and said, did I do something to offend you? What, what is wrong? Yes, you did. And she began to unload on her. And she said, whoa, I didn't do those things. But it wasn't enough. The gal just wouldn't stop. She just called her all kinds of names. And he said, I told you, leave it alone. You should have left it alone. There are people who will try to manipulate you by sulking or, you know, turning their head every time they see you. If that's where you're at, I'll leave you alone until you get past it. It's okay. <laughs> but I'm not going to come and try to take you and say, oh, bless your heart. Well, you know what? God doesn't do that all that much. Either. Remember when Elijah, after he had been on top of Mount Carmel, and challenged the 400 prophets of Baal to say, let us see who's really God. Let the God who answered by fire be the one we call God. And that day, the prophets of Baal, all day long, they did their incantations and their routines and all, but they were used to bringing a little fire with them, but Elijah said, no, nope, can't be your fire. It's got to come from God. So then uh, nothing happened towards the time of the evening sacrifice. He said, well, give me a chance. He, he put his sacrifice up on the altar he had built. He said, well, I don't want anybody thinking it caught fire by chance. Put some water on it. They put four barrels of water on it. He dug a little ditch around it. He said, no, that's not enough. Give me another four. And they put another four on there. Pretty soon he said, no, no, that's not enough. I put enough. They put 12 barrels of water on that sacrifice. I mean, he saturated everything. And then he stepped back and said a little pre-sentence prayer and called whack. Fire came down to heaven and literally vaporized that entire animal, the water, and even the dirt. There's nothing but shiny rocks left behind. And all the people began to declare, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And, they, uh, and Elijah grabbed the sword and started chasing those prophets of Baal. And the people joined him. And they, they killed them all right there. Now, folks, if you had that kind of a service, would you say, boy, we had a great service today. That ought to last for a couple days anyhow, huh? That night, the word got out that Jezebel had said, oh, God do to me and even more so if I don't make Elijah like one of those prophets of Baal. And Elijah left town and went and hid in a cave. Said, because I'll tell you something about that Jezebel. She may be a lying thinker, but man, when she says she's going to kill you, she don't lie. She doesn't. So he's hiding in the cave, and the Lord comes by. Says, Elijah, I want to talk to you. 
what are you doing hiding out here? He said, Lord, did you hear what Jezebel said? She wants to kill me. You might think the Lord would have said, well, you know, like I know it's tough being a prophet of God and sometimes, and, you know, sometimes the enemy can be pretty cruel, you know. No, what, you know what the Lord said to him? The Lord didn't say, oh, I understand you're going through a rough time today. <laughs> when you start sulking and saying, feel sorry for me, God, God doesn't get in on the pity part. You know, it's kind of like the Lord has this opinion that if you've got self-pity, you've got already got more pity than you need. Right. He won't give you any more. The Lord didn't give Elijah any pity. Instead, the Lord told him, I've got plenty more who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You get up and get busy doing the work I called you to do. Lord, you're not going to feel sorry for me a little bit? No. Quit sulking and feeling sorry for yourself. Get busy. Well, Ahab, he was the kind that sulked every time he didn't get his way. And he looked out his window one day and saw that one of his neighbors had a beautiful vineyard. And he thought, man, I'd like to have that vineyard. So he went down and he visited Naboth and said, Naboth, you tell me what you want for this vineyard. I want it and I will pay any price you ask. Uh, you don't even have to call a real estate agent in here. I don't care what the market value is. You just name your price. I'm going to buy it. And David said, no, you can't buy it because the law says it belongs in my family. And I can't sell it. That's right. He said, well, you can buy another piece for your family. I I I'll, I'll pay you real good. I'll give you so much that you can buy a really nice place somewhere else. And David says, sorry, sir, uh, I'd love to help you, but that's not an option. It's not for sale. Ahab went back to his house, his beautiful palace, with all the luxury and all the finest that was available in his day, and all the servants that were there to cater to his every whim. And he went and laid down on the bed, turned his face to the wall, and wouldn't eat, wouldn't talk to anybody. Jezebel came in to see him and said, Hey, Ham, what's wrong? I'll tell you what's wrong. I wanted to buy Naboth's vineyard, and he wouldn't sell it to me. And he was just having a real pity party fit. So Jezebel said, well, don't you worry, honey. I'll take care of this. I'll get that for you. And she got some people to uh, conjure up some false charges against him and then had him found guilty. And they executed him right there in the town square. Well, when he was dead, his property went up for sale. And Jezebel said, hey. Name properties up for sale. If you want to go get it, oh, he went and got it, and he was having the time of his life. Oh, he was a happy boy now. He wasn't. He wasn't depressed anymore. He just enjoying the good life. He was standing there in his vineyard, looking around, saying, "Boy, I got a great vineyard. I love this." And that prophet Elijah comes by to mess up his good day. <laughs> and Elijah said, "What do you think you're doing?" This isn't your, yes, it is. I paid for a third square. Yeah, you had neighbors killed. I find it interesting. It was Jezebel's manipulation that got him killed. But the prophet of God told Ahab, you killed him. He said, You think you got by with it? Don't kill him. Right there where the dogs licked up, neighbors' blood. That's where they're going to lick up your blood, too. And God is going to bring judgment on you like you never imagined. Let me tell you something. Ahab may have been a spoiled brat, but he was raised knowing the voice of God. And he knew, I am in trouble. And you know what he did? He began to pray and repent. He don't sackcloth. 
he sat down uh, in the dirt and began to cry and say, oh God, I've done the wrong thing. Please forgive me. He didn't just say the words. He actually began to truly repent. God told Elijah, Ahab repenting. Go back and tell him, I won't bring the judgment until after he dies. I'm going to bring the judgment anyhow, but I'll save it for until he dies. Now, my way of thinking was, God, he don't deserve any forgiveness. Lord, why are you asking us to do this? Don't get me. I felt a whole lot like the prophet Jonah, you know, when he went to Nineveh to tell him in 40 days God's going to destroy this city. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and get it done, Lord. I want to see. I'm going to just sit up here on the side of the hill and watch him die. I kind of thought that about Ahab. But the Lord saw his repentance. And the Lord said, Elijah, go tell him. I'm going to hold back the judgment because he repented. He wasn't using I'm sorry as a manipulation. He really began to repent. His problem was after he repented, he didn't stay repentant. He knew that you need to truly repent, but he kept listening to the wrong voices. And so, sure enough, he did get killed and his body was dragged back to Jerusalem or to Samaria. And there in the square where the dogs licked up the blood of David, they licked the blood off of his chariot and he died in. But what I found so significant about that story is when Ahab truly repented, God gave him mercy. Let's turn, if you will, over to the book of 1 John. And we're going to look there in that uh, the second chapter. Let's, it's the first chapter, the end of the chapter, and we'll run over into the second chapter. First John, chapter 1, beginning with verse 9. The Apostle John tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, he says, my little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. If any man, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Go back to verse 9 up there. And if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's an interesting thing. How can you confess a sin if you don't know you have sin? So when he said confess your sins, he's saying confess what you know you've done wrong. But then he said when you do that, God will give you cleansing from the rest of the sins that you don't even know was sin in your life. He'll cleanse you from all unrighteousness. You know, there is an unfolding revelation in the walk with God. And so sometimes things that we got by with doing for years, the Lord starts holding to us to account and won't let us get by with it anymore. Lord, I've always done it that way. And the Holy Spirit is convicting you and saying, yeah, but I don't want it done that way. And you're beginning to learn that there are some, the scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. As we walk with God, he shows us more and expects more of us. So that's what the revelation of repentance is all about. To confess your sins and he will forgive you of your sins 
and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Anyone who says, I've never sinned, is uh, only lying to themselves because the rest of us know that. <laughs> Anybody who says, well, now for me, I can tell you this. I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was only 11 years old. And I can honestly say, standing here in this pulpit today, April 26th of 2020, that not one time since that day, some 65 years ago, not one time since that day have I sinned when I was listening to the Holy Spirit. Now, I, my big problem is sometimes I'm really hard of hearing when the Spirit's talking to me, and I have had to repent a lot of times since that day. But I'm here to tell you God is faithful. And His Word says that if I confess my sin, He'll cleanse me. He'll forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So I'm not standing here a sinner today. Somebody said, well, we're all sinners. That's not what the scripture said. The, the Bible says we have been born again. If I am covered with the blood of Jesus Christ, then I'm no longer a sinner, but I am what the scripture calls the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, don't ever misquote that verse. Somebody said, well, I'm righteousness. See, the Bible says, no, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. You're not the righteousness of God. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. It's the Christ in you that's the righteousness in you. But repentance is a gift. When the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin in your life, friend, don't resent it, but instead run to it and say, yes, Lord, your conviction of my sin is just to help me be delivered from the curse of my sin. Would you stand with me this morning? It says, if peradventure God might grant them repentance. Because if we truly repent, He will truly forgive us. Now, folks, if you stomp on my toe and say, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to forgive you. At least by the time I quit limping. <laughs> but if you come up the next time I see you and stomp on my toe again, I'm going to say, hey, cut that out. You know, I was over at the post office the other day. And there was a young lady coming down the steps as I started up. She turned around and whack hit me on the top of the head with her curled up fist and really gave me a really strong walk. I turned around and said, hey, what was that all about? And then I noticed she had a mental issue and the guy who was supposed to be responsible for her said, oh, sorry, she, she does it. What I wanted to do is go wallop him and say, keep a better eye on her. Instead, I just moved on. But I guarantee you, if I go over to the post office and see her coming down the steps again, I'll go to the other steps. <laughs> If you thump on my toe two or three times, I want to make sure we keep a little distance next time you come around. Uh, say, well, I said I'm sorry. You saying you're sorry didn't mean it was okay for you to stomp on me again. Repentance is not a manipulation. Repentance is to turn around, to change. It means to stop doing what you're doing and go the other way. So when we repent, we need to tell God, by your help, I won't do it again. Paul says, yeah, sometimes the very thing I say I'm not going to do, I find myself doing it again. Then I've got to repent again and keep working on it. Don't stop because if you'll keep working on it, you'll break through to victory by the help of the Lord. Lord, thank you today because as a result of your great sacrifice, on the cross of Calvary, we have a hope 
of deliverance from sin and power to live above sin. Lord, let your Holy Spirit move in us and cleanse us and reveal to us that which is not pleasing to you, that we might lead lives that glorify you and honor you. Lord, thank you for the great gift of repentance. Help us never use it carelessly or callously, but may we truly and sincerely humble ourselves before you, confess our sins, and accept your forgiveness by the blood of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you. Have a great Sunday afternoon.